I think we're ready to get started. Welcome to our April meeting. I'm Trevor Holyoke. I'm the technology specialist for the club and I'll be conducting tonight. And Carl, you are up first. Oh wow, good thing I'm already standing up, huh? Yes. All right. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm all talked out now. <laughs> all right, good crowd. Uh, a couple things that we wanted to uh, announce, uh, we'll, we'll continue pounding on uh, the 7-6 barbecue. That will be on June 4th. It usually goes up 10 to 3 or so, but if somebody wants to come out and uh, help out by putting up an antenna, we always put an, uh, Node G always, you know, puts up an HF station and we help them put up an antenna. So the guys that haven't got on HF before have an opportunity to get on and, uh, and uh, see what it's like and make some contacts. It's down there in a hole at Highland Glen Park, but we still get out pretty good down there. It's it's it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, you try and do some, we'll try and do some barbecue chicken, and, and the rest of it's potluck. And uh, we have the pavilion uh, there. Uh, Lynn up in Highland uh, secures that for us every year, and so uh, with, um, anybody, everybody's welcome. Parking's a little tough, especially if the weather's nice. So if you get there earlier, you get there, the better parking you might you know find. But it's Highland Glen Park. If you're not familiar with it, it's right below Lone Peak High School. And uh, it's got a little four acre lake there and it's a nice little uh, spot to bring your family and let the kids play around and people have caught fish there before while we've been having a good time there and everything else. So anyway, uh, come join us. We, the seven sixers have been doing barbecue there ever since I've been a seven sixer, about 11, 12 years. They haven't been doing it there, haven't been doing it there somewhere else. We've been doing it here about five or six years now. So, but come on, join us, have a good time. Um, and if you forget, uh, about it. We mention it every week on the Seven Sixers Net on Wednesday nights. So uh, uh, come out and you know familiarize yourself with that net if you want. I always tell people get it on the calendar. Get it on the calendar now before some lame <laughs> everybody knows what I'm going to say. Before some lame family reunion gets in the way. Okay. Um, July 14th, 6 p.m. Linden Community Center. Uh, they're calling this a ha uh, ugly antenna contest and ham fair. Yep, combined. Combined. And so he's been talking about doing this uh, ugly antenna contest for about a, I don't know, more than a year now. So it's funny. Looks like it might actually happen. So uh, find your ugliest antenna uh, or make one and, and uh, make sure it gets out because you got to be able to make a contact on it. And uh, and uh, come out and have some fun with that. I've got my mind on something. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but exactly. But you have a mind. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Barely. Are you just going to it's pay just... the J. Paul Redder paint? <laughs> no, but I'm going to see how many bins I can I can put in it and make it still work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what what band do you think makes you contact? I don't think that I don't think there's there's been no there's been no. No limit. I mean, if you want to do, you know, two meter, four forty, HF, whatever. You know, it's it, whatever you can conjure up. So, is there a distance involved in making your contact? Uh, I, I don't one think there's one city block. One city block. One city block. Oh, so, you know, a mill bowl. Where is that? I don't see Craig here tonight. Huh? <laughs> well, that might. You might win it with that. Anyway, um, so having said all that. Um, that's, that's the, the content he wanted me to talk about tonight, but I wanted to, wanted to mention one thing. Um, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but many of you might have known uh, George N9 e EJS. EJS, that's what I thought it was, N9 EJS. He lived in Lehigh. Uh, he bought an antenna from me, he lived in a little house down there in the middle of town, and uh, then moved up here into a senior center, and then uh, his family wanted him to head back out to uh, Chicago a couple of years ago and be closer to family. But he was on the radio quite a bit. Uh, he's a silent key now, so um, I just thought we'd you know mention that ham radio was one of the. It was I don't know his, the way his family talked on Facebook. It sounded like uh, they, he loved his ham radio more than his family. But uh, <laughs> uh, he uh, uh, he was uh, I think he might have been to this meeting a couple of times, yeah. and uh, and he was a nice old guy, um, and he he loved getting on the radio back in the days when Nick would get on and stuff like that. He, uh, he got on and, and uh, he, he was a great old guy. But anyway, uh, Noji let me know the other day that he, that he uh, was a silent key and he passed away. So we just thought we'd let everybody know and 
who might not have been uh, privy to that or been his friend on Facebook or something. Anyway, that's all I got. Oh, gee, looks like Wendy's up. School building. There are sessions at 9, 10, and 11. And if you knock on the window, we'll let you in. Which window? <laughs> <laughs> knock on the window on the door. <laughs> uh, so there are also opportunities if anyone is interested in presenting, please contact Nochi. If you are, there is no fee for this, it's um, all levels. There's beginner interest level classes uh, inform and information for advanced level um, ham radio. So if you're interested in that, show up. It's just come as you are. So three classes, or three times with multiple classes. Get there earlier, where are you? <laughs> oh, can I mention yes. just a couple of their topics? My voice isn't very loud, so maybe you can repeat it. Yeah. It, so the beginner topics include chirp and repeaters. The advanced <coughs> topics include DX and vertical intervals. I might repeat that. So beginner topics include chirp and um, repeat. repeaters, and the advanced topics include DX and vertical antennas. So those are some interest. If you're interested in those, look specifically uh, for those classes. What room? When you get there, it'll be announced on the door. Where's the park over there? In the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, parking lot's not, the parking lot's not very big, yeah. but, but there is usually room over at the creamery. That's where I ended up parking the other day. Yeah. So if you can't make it to the parking lot, try to get creamery. Which door do you go? There's a lot of doors. Any of the doors. Any of the doors. So, and then they'll be just pointing in the right direction to the correct right room. Just keep knocking on every window until somebody answers the water. Or, or you can volunteer to be a door holder, a door monitor. Or you can call Stan. You can let people in between levels. Okay. So we are looking forward to the field day activities, which are June 25th through June 26th. We will be um, near Strawberry, not in an exact location, but near the Strawberry Reservoir. Joe's not here. He's not taking pictures. Um, we are going to need some uh, volunteers to uh, have uh, RV stations, and we usually have three, so if you are willing to Accommodate the club, please talk, talk to Noji. <laughs> she just wanted a picture taken. <laughs> we have, we do have people go up early and set up, so we will be available. I know some people are going up much earlier in the week. Joe talk, Joe said he's going up. Monday. Our son and I are going up on Monday. Yeah. We're staying all week. Yeah, some people go up and camp all week and have a great time. It's a, bit, a chance to get out and nature with your family. Uh, we do three, there's three no. stations that uh, are all within a thousand meter radius, thousand foot radius. Thousand foot radius. Thousand foot radius. And the competition, it is a club competition, so anything you do benefits the club. Uh, status and it goes from noon on Saturday to noon on Sunday. So we always put up three big antennas. It's a big deal. It's a lot of fun. You can learn about stuff. Carl. We always put up four antennas because we always get, oh. get, up, get on the air station. That's right. But we're all going to be a mile further down the road, right? At that yeah. spot that we scouted out last year. Yeah. So it, it's not at the exact same place that we were yeah. the previous years. There was been too much competition yeah. for Spots. Spots and then too much rowdiness there. Yeah, Ryan. How about uh, like uh, people are having trouble finding air? Are you guys monitoring a simplex frequency up there? We will be. Yeah. We're also going to be putting out a GPS location, so it will come shortly. Uh, it will be on our website shortly. <laughs> we 
Anything else? Yeah. Okay. What if I have a family reunion now? <laughs> You'll have to spend some time with us bring the family. No, do that. You know, if you get your family really used to it, they start asking you what we can just deal with. They work around you. I don't care. It's been on the same weekend for the last 10 years. No, thanks, Wendy. <laughs> Somebody left their phone up here. Oh, that's mine. Do you think, does this take photos? Can you stand up one more time? Is your phone? No, it's not. It's mine. I just want to take your photo. It's not mine. This is Trevor's phone. It's mine. You know, on, on field day, we just have so much fun. And did you tell them about the potluck? I mean, oh, no, I we don't. have we have the most amazing potluck at the field day because people bring all kinds of good stuff. And I don't even know what we're going to have to eat there. We haven't kind of talked about it and decided that, but whatever we do, Wendy always comes up with something terrific. And, and you know, bless her heart, she's always prepares this stuff. And it's just crazy madhouse, but she always does a wonderful job. At any rate, um, yeah, <clears throat> looking forward to that. And all the contacts, and yeah, we will have a go station. Except this time, the go station will be inside a, a, a donated um, um, RV. So that'd be kind of cool this time. Um, anyway, um, on a personal note, uh, we have a few people that have recently uh, received their Henry Needle licenses, and there they, they they are. If any of these people is here this tonight, could you please stand? Not one. Well, I, we did send out the invitation, but that's all right. So, and, and because though we know that even though you're not here, you are watching us on YouTube. So please go ahead and stand wherever you are. Let's give a big hand. All right, not to be outdone, there are also those we want to congratulate for receiving an upgrade to the license. Um, Laura, Ryan, and Jessica, can you please stand? <laughs> yeah, Ryan and Jessica are husband and wife, and uh, um, they didn't want to have each other to be outdone by each other, so it was a competition <laughs> match, but they pulled it off. And, um, Who got the better score on the test? Um, actually, yeah, 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 Jessica, oh, wow. Wow. You know, but you know, I honestly didn't expect anything less of her. She's that brilliant. <laughs> anyway, there we go. So congratulations. All right. Well, next up is our. No, it's there, uh, Ryan. No, wait, wait. We have one more person that'd like to say something. Tom Hoots, are you here? Yeah. Go ahead and come on up and come on down. Take it away. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm a new ham, new member of the exam at the end of the year, and I'll be in two weeks. A um, little bit about myself. Um, I have no relatives, no neighbors, nobody that I ever knew that was a ham operator, except for an electronics teacher. Um, when my wife and I got married 42 years ago, I had an interest. We, I, we were living in Virginia, a ton of ham stores back then. I built a kit, an HR 1680 receiver, and I was going to then build the 1681 transmitter. Went into one of the stores and the, the guy there said, we just took a trade in on a brand new Kenwood T499. I know that's really old. It is. Anyway, life took over, college, family, business, put it all on the shelf, forgot about it. We moved back to Utah, um, which is where both my wife and I are from, and I sort of got interested again, went over to, I think it was a communication specialist, it was Bob Wood over on 21st South, like 10th East, bought a new venture paddle, um, the MFJ Keir, played with it for a couple of weeks, put it on the shelf, forgot about it. Um, then they did, the microphone. Excuse me? Oh, how's that? Is that better? Thank you. Then I bought a, uh, uh, the uh, PK-232 came out. I bought that, played with it for a couple of weeks, put it on the shelf. Now that I'm ready to retire, I got interested. I had a bucket list to at least take the exam. I fly drones, I fly RC, cell planes, full-size cell planes. Um, and I thought it'd be nice to have a, a technician's license so I don't have to deal with the low power 
restrictions. Came and took the test, and somehow you guys sort of sucked me into the whole deal. And I took it, you know, like hook, hook, line, and sinker. Bought a new uh, Icon 7300. One of my friends, uh, who's been in a, a ham but has been active for a number of years, he was going to be my wingman, and we decided we we're going to go up and swap meet a month and a half ago. The night before, he called, told me, I don't feel like going, go ahead. So I went up there on my own, not knowing what to expect. I shuffled through. Um, I didn't buy anything until the very end. Those of you that attended, you might remember there was a couple on the far end that had an inordinate amount of equipment. I inordinate. I bought a, a dual band radio, got home, didn't work. Lights were dead on it, which is okay. I'm an electrical engineer, I'm an engineering firm. Sat down, worked it all out, tuned it up, it works great. Then it took about two weeks to figure out who these people were. Because I have an interest in QRP, CW, and they had three 817s. And I thought, well, I can always just buy, go buy a new 818. Called them up, finally found them, and they said, those are all gone. I talked to them further, and they literally, my read on them was correct. Sorry, I, I tend to be quite verbose, so I'll try to keep it really short. Anyway, they said, we didn't sell a single rig other than the handhelds, the, the walkies. And I said, well, first of all, I don't know what was the right venue. And some of the prices I saw probably weren't quite right. And I said, listen, I know you guys aren't ham guys. Let me help you out. So what we did was we went through each radio. We documented the part number, the model number, the manufacturer. Uh, I brought equipment over. We ran an RF test to make sure that it was putting down a signal, make sure that the receiver was working. And for the most part, all the bits and pieces were there power cord, the mic, the brackets, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to pass these out when I'm done. Uh, guy's a nice guy. He and his wife are both great. They're not ham radio guys. They never will be. His dad was, his dad's name was Fred DeSmith. I know he was up in the Utah club. It was KI7KM was his call sign. Anyway, I would just ask you if there's anything in interest, pick a look at it. It's been grouped by manufacturer, so you should be able to read it and decided it was something for you. Of all the equipment they had, there were maybe one or two pieces I would say perhaps came from a, a, a smoking environment. The rest of it, I didn't see any signs of that. I happened to have acquired one of the receivers that had a lovely nicotine pattern on the inside, which I cleaned it out, and it's working. Um, there were some good radios there, though. And making them a, a respectable offer. Uh, I, I found them just outstanding people to deal with. Uh, if there's anything that I can do to help, I, I told John and Holly, I'd be more than happy to field any questions because they're not the guys to ask. If they wanted further testing or something else, I'll look at it. I don't want to fix the equipment, that's not my job. I just do this for no reason other than just help these guys out. I don't know if there's any questions. If not, let me pass this around. Go ahead and take one. Is it all right to post that information? We have I mean, we run a Facebook group called uh, Utah Amateur Radio. I, I've uh, seen Star. it. I, I asked him about that. Yeah. And and he said, yeah. He they were a little cautious. They just didn't want to get beat up by yeah. too many people contacting. So basically, this is we, this is three pages of stuff. Oh, oh. This is about one third of what they have. I was there. I saw it. Yeah. 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 I, I, I bought a lot of it already. Yeah. Was that? So I bought a lot of their stuff. Yeah. yeah there, and there were sadly. Yeah, the A17s are all gone. I found that out. Yeah, uh, but also, the, also the, uh, the the antenna tuners all disappeared. And literally, I swear, for those receivers that he had or transceivers that didn't have a built-in, he had an LDG or something else. They're all gone. Yeah. He didn't know, and I'm sure whoever got them got it. The deal of the century. Uh, there's also more handhelds and antennas and some other stuff. Uh, I told John that I'd help him at least sort of try to document that so it's easier for you to at least go down the list and see. I said there might be some stuff that nobody cares about. There might be some stuff that junkers want or they want for volunteer parts to fix the unit. Yeah. What cities do they live in? Uh, they're up in uh, Mill Creek okay. in Salt Lake. But just outstanding folks. And like I say, I, um, I tried to go through and at least look at it from a standpoint of a, a slight engineering perspective. Does it work? Does it look like it works? Is there something wacky about it or something that doesn't work? 
And so I'd say that there's a, a pretty high level of confidence that if you get it, it's going to be it's going to be good. I bought a, an 897 from them when I wasn't able to get the 817s. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it's sort of an offshoot of the 817s, just a little bit bigger. You put dual batteries in it. It, it'll run at 100 watts if you power it externally. Otherwise, it can run on two separate batteries. You can charge one by the other one's being used. It was just in elegant shape. You'd also put in the, the uh, high precision TXO inside, uh, or T TXO inside. That was true with a lot of the stuff. Some of them had the voice modules, some of the filters. I didn't tear it apart to see if they had those, so it's kind of up to you. Anyway, let me pass this around. Um, take one if you care. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. And if you have any questions, uh, I, I have visited the, the club's Facebook site once. I just talked briefly about um, the dual band radio, which was an FT5100. If you search for that or for me, Tom Hoops, um, you can contact me there. Um, no, she's got the information. I'm on uh, uh, QRZ. That's it. Thank you. Okay. We are now ready for the main event. Um, Steve Fleischer, sorry if I mispronounced that, Jeremy Stallard and Mike Sawyer will be talking about emergency service today. So. All right, sorry about that. Often, yeah, all kinds of fun with the technical difficulties and whatnot. But anyway, um, Noji asked me to uh, give a little bit of information about UCARES. That's actually where we had met many years ago. But uh, just some background with it. Uh, UCARES is the Utah County Aries Group Amateur Radio Emergency Services. Uh, it's the ARL, ARRL. Uh, has set up a national organization for handling emergency services. And it's you know one of the ways we're able to keep access to the bandwidth, the bands that we do have, is because we're able to convince Congress that we do a lot of public service, and uh, we're out there helping. And uh, the RL has been instrumental in helping us keep that bandwidth. Now it hasn't always been successful. Since I've had my license, we've lost half of the 220 band. Uh, we've the 2.4 gigahertz band has been taken over by the Wi-Fi uh, devices in, and uh, commercial units and whatnot, and we're losing part of the 5 megahertz band as well. But uh, they do a pretty decent job. 40 plus on their crash in South County in Utah County office was out uh, trying to find the place. They had fire department on others, and certain rescue was doing their thing on Waukee Talk. They got a hold of Dave Martin and a couple of other people who were amateur radio operators at the time, and uh, they helped them coordinate, communicate, and uh, they were able to find the airplane, find the people, and uh, proceed. And uh, the sheriff's office at that time said, "Hey, you know, we need to get a group like this going." Well, amateur radios. One of the requirements is we're all volunteers. <laughs> So uh, they got a group. At, at one time, there were over 100 people uh, actively on the rolls, and uh, they broke it down a little bit more and uh, kept about 30, 30 to 35 people normally that are with the uh, they call the sheriff's communication auxiliary team, and the rest they said everybody else, uh, well, including those ones, uh, set up in the uh, Utah County Amateur Radio Emergency Services group. Uh, but so it's been going pretty much constantly for 40 some odd years. Uh, whereas the club here tonight is a lot of uh, focus is on having fun with the, with the hobby, uh, learning more about it, the electromagnetic spectrum, all of that fun stuff. Uh, Aries is more focused on community service, the emergency response, uh, training, knowing what the incident command system is, net control, how to work with different organizations and how to be available when there's a call out or a need for us in the city. So a lot of cities, um, we take Linden for example, have uh, been working with us for a number of years. They get approached every six months to a year or so by some somebody new and excited in the hobby saying, I've got my amateur radio license, let me come in and take over everything. And uh, uh, they, 
they send them our way or we'll, we'll coordinate and go through the national levels of certification just so the different city and emergency managers can be assured that the people that have been through the certification know what they're doing. They know that they're not going to go out and put red and blue lights on their car and you know immediately try and jump in and you laugh there's <laughs> been some stories but no, we'll uh, move on from there but uh, we have been involved in quite a few things over the years uh, we mentioned the search and rescue we've helped out with uh, fire watches and evacuations uh, I don't know how many people remember the dump fire over with Eagle Mountain, but they had us on rotations uh, helping with the evacuations, helping with monitoring the uh, Red Cross Center, uh, things like that. You know, Cedar Hills mudslide, the Dread Narrows explosion. Then we've got the recurring things every year, uh, Freedom Festival Parade. Uh, you want to talk about a fun one. We're trying to get a operator out on every city block, uh, preferably two during the whole length of the parade. And we've gone from uh, you know, occasionally finding kids and returning to their parents to uh, having a less than two minutes between the time the parent notices the kid has wandered off or when the kid finds us and, uh, re and getting them back together with their parents and things like that. And you know, we've helped out all over different counties uh, or different cities and we have moved on to outside of the county as needed. But our main focus is here in Utah County. It's you know neighbors helping neighbors, uh, getting a chance to uh, get out and uh, use the radios. Okay, um, Noj, you mentioned that I uh, wanted this to be a lot of personal preparedness, and how the how UCARES ties in with that. Now I mentioned the different levels of certification you can go through. Uh, the first thing of note is our very first requirement is our family preparedness certification. You can't uh, help others unless you're taking care of yourself. You know, if there's an earthquake, we've got the great shakeout coming out here in a little bit, preparation for, uh, you know, what happens if there's a big earthquake where everything hits the fan. One of the first things we do is we check out ourselves? Or is our family ready? Do we have an emergency uh, plan? Do we have our 72-hour kits? Do we know, uh, know where the batteries are? Can we li survive if there's something that happens? Because if your fam you and your family aren't taken care of first, your mind's not going to be in the game when you're out helping others. And then we go through the four different levels of certification that we have. The first is just real easy, basic equipment. Uh, do you have a radio? Can you operate it? Do you have a, a earpiece and a, hand, and a mic? And there's some other things, but it's really basic. So come, get involved, meet the group, uh, visit a uh, one of the emergency operations centers in the area, and uh, start to get involved. Uh, we do do a lot of coordination with uh, state and uh, county agencies, so what. Uh, as we work through the different levels of certification, we get introduced to the incident command system. Uh, it's the ICS courses they have through uh, FEMA and the NIMS uh, courses. So uh, most of them are available online. They're free. We've got links to them so you can, if you're interested, uh, viewcares.org is our website and you provide all, all the links. It's, you can follow that through all, for all the information there. But through the, through the uh, different uh, levels of certification, you move from just being a participant to being in a supporting role where we know we can call you up and you can jump in and get a position and support it, to being a responsible role uh, with our level three certification. We actually, uh, part of level three certification is uh, receiving cert certification, which will be uh, talked about in even more detail shortly. And then you move on to level four certification where you finish out the ICS courses um, so that you're up and ready to run and work with the different uh, emergency responses or response teams that come into the area, whether it's the uh, wildland fire, whenever they've got a call out, or whether it's uh, a local emergency or whatever the need is, the incident command system is set up to uh, so that everybody knows what to expect when they come into a uh, environment where there's something going on. 
As far as why joining with us, uh, well, a lot of it's if you're interested. If you're interested in serving your community, if you're interested in being a participant that gets out and helps other people, uh, you want to take that ham radio that you've studied to so get your license to use, you want to talk into it, you want to be able to communicate with others, um, it's a great opportunity. Uh, one of the fun things about it is we, we're uh, called out every year to help out with the different fireworks in the area, Orem Summerfest, Spring Spanish Fork. We, they've got us on perimeter watch. So, you know, you're, you've got the fireworks going off right overhead, bring the family, stick them on the perimeter near you, and they've got a, you've got the best seats in the house. Uh, great chance to get the kids or grandkids out to the parades, and uh, you know, it's just fun being out and helping neighbors. Most times it's fun, sometimes it's not, sometimes you're out for, for an emergency. Uh, we've helped with body retrievals, um, search and rescue, and other things in the past, and you know, that, that's not as fun, but it's an important factor, and when things come to an end, the family is very appreciative of the help that we've been able to provide. Let's see, even if you don't join us, and you want to just listen in or hear what's going on, we have the weekly training nets on Tuesday nights at 9 o'clock on 14734. Uh, we have an email list that you can uh, sign up with, or sign up to be on if you would like. Uh, we, do, we have the announcements of when the nets are going to be, when our interfaces are going to be, what the topics are going to be. Um, the interface, uh, Topics have been anywhere from 3D printing to uh, electromagnetic magnetic wavelengths and uh, how the repeaters work down to the nitty-gritty science involved. And uh, we've had build-it nights where we're building J-poles or uh, done certain boards a couple times. And uh, quite a few different things. I think we've done five or six different J-poles or other uh, tape measure Yag Yagi antennas and other things. But uh, it's a chance to get out and meet other amateur radios. I mean, we've got a great group here. Uh, it's just some, a, a, a slightly different focus. But uh, any questions? Yeah? Where do you use that? Uh, Sheriff's, uh, Sheriff's Office uh, North Annex uh, training. It's right. It's not too far from the jail. Uh, they have a training office that they've or they've set up, and we go in and meet them there. Well, when we're meeting in person. Well, we had the last in-person meeting was right here. Oh yeah, right, right outside. Uh, was it two, three days, two days ago now? Yeah. It was just that we did it. Nice, it, uh, nice uh, and cool for those who like cold water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was. But the, we had the mobile command center from the county out and uh, had a chance to get people through it and tour it and uh, see what see what was going on there and chance to meet in person. How big is your grapevine? See what he had. Uh, on the rolls are actually showing up every time. <laughs> we, we, we've got about 600 people that are uh, on the email list. Uh, of those, we probably have about 75 or 80 that are regularly participating throughout the year. Can you explain a little bit more about the personal preparedness program? Uh, the family preparedness one? Yeah. Sure. Um, Oh, I don't. Give me one second. If you go to youcares.org, let's see if we've got internet in here. We may not. We do? Okay. Go up, and we've got a section for resources. And then we've got under the certification, there we have a list of our PDFs that we have. And you can click on the family preparedness, sorry, Aries Family Prep. And it will go through the list of uh, things to focus on. Uh, the first is just an introduction. And then uh, it'll have a list of uh, things that we're encouraging and actually requiring people to be aware of down here at the bottom. It's got some brief introduction paragraphs. Uh, 
the requirements, the 72-hour kit, 72-hour uh, kit, uh, and things like that. And then the, the plan, the things to go over with the family if you're still at home with the kids, if they haven't all moved out on you, or if they have moved out and come back, as the case may be. No, <laughs> see how that goes. But uh, and uh, but uh, yeah, we've only got so much time tonight. But uh, if you go to ucares.org and, and look in the resources folder, it'll be you can find the information there. Any other questions? I got a quick one. Sure. And it's not a complaint, but um, I've tried to get on that uh, that net a few times. Okay. And I found that that nine o'clock is just so stinking late on a Tuesday night yeah. for somebody that has to get up at four thirty in the morning. How come so late? Uh, mainly because it had, was conflicting with all kinds of other things earlier, back when they were, we were getting started. Uh, we had a lot of scoutmasters who are on Tuesday nights from 7 until 8.30 or 8.45. They're dealing with scouts. Um, you've got people involved in other uh, things, and it was just the, the, the time when everybody, when more people could make it. And it is late. Yes, you know, my wife has gotten after me a couple times for <laughs> having the radio in the bedroom and, and, and that sort of thing. But uh, Ouch. yeah, but, uh, we, we try and do the. Like the like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we try. We at least have the interface at seven o'clock. But yeah. Okay. Yes. You talk, you talk about certification. So uh -huh. if you do this. You you have a straight finish? Have you passed? Or what? Uh, most, see, some of it is. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the other links are uh, on that same the same page I just showed you. But uh, for the NIMS, uh, the ICS courses, uh, the requirements for that, you just take the course online, print out your test results, bring it in, you're signed oh. off. Okay, so it, yeah, it, it's it mostly self-regulating. Um, the equipment requirements for the first three, the first two levels, all you need is an HT, a little uh, hand, uh, handheld, the microphone, uh, the microphone to go with it, and an earpiece. We found during the parades, if you're trying to talk while you've got sirens going on and people gabbing and everything else, you just can't hear without that earpiece. So the the initial requirements are really simple. Once you get up to level three and four, if you, you want a mobile rig, uh, and preferably if you have a dual band, great. I mean, those used to be you know six hundred, eight hundred dollars. Now you can find them for less than three, less than three hundred. Or um, if you really want to go Chinese knockoff, you can find them for less than a hundred, even for a mobile unit now. So the cost is. Do they need to be truly mobile when you're carrying around? Uh, when I talk mo when I'm talking about mobile, it's just one that you can fit in the car. Uh, we we have uh, one of the options is you know the bag mount antenna rather than uh, drilling a hole in your car. I, I only got away with drilling a hole once. Um, it's an older vehicle, but uh, my wife has threatened bodily harm if I uh, <laughs> to get near the newer vehicles. But uh, it, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, it's just having the equipment to be able to function if there's a call out and if there's uh, something we need to be able to respond to. We do some of a, a, just a promotion. I, I, we do a lot of nets and net practicing and those are great. They're really good. But getting out on these different events are just a great way to really get your experience in. Because things are moving, people are talking, there's a lot of, a lot of noises. And do they have that ability to listen and communicate it's just another step up from from your traditional net. So, and at the same time, you've got a front row seat. So they are they are a lot of fun. Agreed. All right, and, uh, Noji gave me the uh, your overtime warning. So, thanks, and I'll stick around afterward if anybody else has additional questions. Together, uh, I was telling Ryan a three-slide slideshow. It was probably the latest slideshow ever. So I'm going to spare you the slides tonight, but uh, at the cost of having to listen to me talk for 
for 10 minutes. So um, I'll actually be addressing some of the things about that he mentioned about heritage, um, because I think it has a lot of things in common with CERT. But um, Noji asked me to present on CERT tonight, the Community Emergency Response Team. And I know a little bit about it. Um, I'm currently the program manager for Provo Orm CERT for probably just another hour. I'm decided to take another break. <laughs> but uh, I've learned a lot and had some great experiences as a team. So I thought I could relay some of the information that we've learned and uh, some of the concepts that I think apply to radio and CERT and how they can work together. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it general um, as much as possible, even though I was the program manager of Orem Provo. Um, and really, we're from all over the valley here, so um, I'll keep it general. But, UCARES level three requires that you finish CERT training. Well, why? If you don't know what it is, it might not make a lot of sense. But and why are we even talking about it tonight? Well, so we can make sense of it. Now, the main reason is probably that uh, the timely, accurate, and reliable communications are the backbone of any effective emergency response. Communications helps organize, helps inform, and it can bring some lost resources back into play. So um, it has a lot of things in that regard in common with CERT, because CERT is also all about organization. So first I'll explain what CERT is, and then a little more detail of how your CERT team can interface with and adopt amateur radio communications in the Valley. So a quick history of CERT in general, the Mexico City earthquake, <laughs> of 1985 killed a lot of people. Uh, they said, I think conservative estimates were 10,000. Now, a lot of volunteers stepped up to the plate to help try to dig out survivors. Um, they are credited, volunteers, <coughs> untrained volunteers, credited with about maybe 800 saves, which is pretty awesome, at the cost of 100 of their own deaths. So Los Angeles Fire Department took a cue from that. They were already looking into um, creating a, a community-based earthquake preparedness team. They'd even sent a team over to Japan and learned a lot about how they do things. So they developed this program. I think they were the first to call it CERT. And um, they expanded that program. They're very well organized down there. And a few states across the country, early adopters, Utah was one, started adopting that program. Then in, I think it was maybe 93, uh, FEMA took charge of it and standardize the training nationwide so that every CERT team, no matter where you're trained, you have the same basic set of knowledge. So that's kind of where it has spread. And I've, I've only been involved since 2015. Um, there's some in here who've probably 10 years beyond that. So there's a lot of experience for CERT in, the, in this team. Um, this is how FEMA describes it in a nutshell. The FEMA website, the CERT program educates volunteers about disaster preparedness for the hazards that may impact your area and trains you in basic disaster response skills. CERT offers a consistent nationwide approach to volunteer training and organization that professional responders can rely on during disaster situations, allowing them to focus on more complex tasks. So what kind of things do the teams actually do um, after all the talk? Well, in this valley, we've had CERT teams who have helped at Red Cross blood drives, city disaster drills, COVID testing centers, vehicle and pedestrian traffic management, sandbagging, uh, Red Cross mass sheltering practice, first aid stations, and even some light urban search and rescue. Teams have also served as resource pools for service-minded volunteers to help in, well, other city emergency drills and um, help organize family-sponsored missing person searches, staffing information booths, helping with traffic control at COVID testing centers. So, exactly how your team or its volunteers are used really depends on the city. Every city handles it a little bit differently. So that's why I'm having to keep things general here. In Utah Valley, uh, most of our teams are sponsored at the city level, about all of our teams are. Uh, we have active teams in Lehigh, uh, Linden's getting their program started again, uh, Provo and Orem, uh, Springville and Mapleton, Spanish Fork, I don't think I missed any. There's quite a few programs up and down the valley scattered all through it. Um, and some places like up at Heber, I mean, they do things at a county level because of how sparse the population is. So it all depends on where you live. 
but the program basics are all the same. Um, so what you have in common, no matter where you train, is that CERT basic training. That's what they call it. It's a, a series of eight lessons. Um, you have online training that, that actually they developed at University of Utah. And it's been adopted nationwide for CERT. So online training takes care of all that boring lecture material. If any of you have graduated from CERT after an eight-week course, um, man, you got it hard. We're down to four weeks of in-person training because we offloaded all the boring slideshows to that online training and kept the in-person training for the hands-on practicing those skills, building that muscle memory. Yeah, but you get a cool hat on that eight-week training. You get a cool hat, but you only get a cool hat after just four weeks now. <laughs> and you get well, those four weeks of my life. I'll never get back. <laughs> and you get all the paraphernalia too, which we'll talk about. But so, what does basic training cover? Uh, it, it covers quite a bit. Um, personal and family preparedness. That's what it starts out with because that's how important they feel personal preparedness is. And local disaster risks. Then the fire safety, uh, fire extinguisher use, utility shutoff. Disaster medical operations is what they call it, but first aid, knowing how to put together a medical treatment area, um, triage, bandaging, splinting, treating for shock, all sorts of things. Light search and rescue, including search methods, indoor and oh, indoor and urban and uh, rural, and also emergency carries. Like if you're one person, how can you carry someone who's heavier than you? If you're two people, what's the safest way to pull someone? How can you improvise different equipment to carry people? That's one of my favorite topics, obviously. Um, team organization, communications, emergency communications, and ICS. Uh, the incident command system is a, a nationwide system for organizing any kind of a disaster response. And no matter what state you're in, no matter the disaster, the same kind of organization plays out. And so as a CERT, you'll learn how that works so you can better embed yourself uh, when you're asked to um, in an emergency response. Disaster psychology or first aid for mental health uh, for you and for the survivors. How to identify signs of terrorism. And you're also given and trained to use PPE, which includes a helmet, uh, a respirator, filter mask, goggles, gloves, high vis vest. In, this is all done within four weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you're, you're introduced to the concept of these uh, skills in the online training. And then in person, what we've already learned up here, we learn here. So it's, it's an accelerated program now, and it works really well. Um, so you, you learn how to train, how to use that material, all those PPE pieces correctly. And at the end of basic training, we, our team anyway, has encouraged every graduate to get licensed in amateur radio because that emergency response it's so important to have that communications back home. Uh, volunteers for both groups are kind of cut from the same cloth, too. You have a lot of the same interests. So we're getting into some, um, this is some of my opinion. So this is my take on, on why CERT works and how it works and how it's, how it's similar to ARIES. Uh, two key pillars of being an effective CERT volunteer are similar to being an effective emergency radio operator. One, don't be a liability. And two, be an asset. It might sound like they're the same thing, but they're not. A little different, I'll explain. First, don't be a liability. Do not be a further drain on disaster response resources. A trained CERT volunteer is equipped to care for themselves with food, water, sometimes even shelter, but appropriate clothing, sunscreen. They're self-sufficient, so they're not a drain on resources. Unprepared SUVs, they're sometimes called, unprepared, spontaneous, unaffiliated volunteers. That's just people that emerge from the woodwork. Um, they can actually diminish the emergency response because of the resources they consume. Managing waves of unprepared but eager volunteers is uh, at best complicated logistically and at worst it can be a nightmare. Um, I was first involved with VOAD, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters, when I lived in Iowa years ago. And the emergency manager for Sioux City had only one use for Aries <laughs> and, and some of the other groups, and that was to manage all of the unaffiliated volunteers that showed up, just to keep them busy. Corralled in a parking lot, just keep them out of the way. 
So that's what a big problem it is. Um, second, be an asset. You will bring helpful tools, education, and most importantly, the right mindset to be safe. You'll be adaptable. You'll be eager to help. You'll be willing to learn and safety conscious. You'll be able to train unaffiliated volunteers, those spontaneous people, um, in basic tasks on the fly. And in addition to your self-sufficiency equipment, you are equipped to help others. You bring a wide range of skills and experience to bear on overwhelming problems. And you will be a force multiplier. In radio, the same two principles apply when serving a community's emergency communications needs. You want to be self-sufficient so you're not a liability. You want to be prepared to help others provide useful service so that you're an asset. Beyond preparedness, you also need teamwork, and that's a big part of CERT. One of the things we cover in detail in basic training is to organize and operate as a team. And uh, it's really interesting watching these teams coalesce. They go through all the stages, the rocky stages of team development. Um, and they, at the end of it, they're at the performing stage where they're actually doing things really efficiently. It's really fun watching these teams come together and learn a common purpose uses the incident command system to create teams and subteams, and it's pretty easy though when we're doing a tabletop exercise. Because we're all in the same room, we're all standing around the same table, looking at the same map, and we don't even have to use radios because we're just talking to people across the table. What we don't get a lot of practice with is doing all this organization, planning and response and search patterns uh, exclusively by radio. That's hugely challenging. Without those visual cues, it's really hard to communicate, and that's definitely a great spot for radio to come in. Without practiced hands using those devices, um, the entire response can be hampered. And it's those practiced hams, 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 are what amateur radio nets help develop. And actually putting those hands to use in community service, like for festivals, uh, fireworks, and uh, marathons, um, and parades, that further develops those skills, so you're not trying to learn it for the first time when you need it. Like CERT training, your radio communications abilities are a force multiplier. That means your solitary presence can help the entire event or response go smoother. I've told some of our classes, and I still stand by this, that I'd rather have a response team of five who can communicate than a team of 20 that can't. Because uh, it's really hard to be effective at all without adequate communication. So you cares is recognized and supported at the county level, which is great. They're a resource that's always there, and they're always in mind. Um, CERT teams, because they're affiliated more with cities, they're not always as preeminent in people's thoughts for response uh, teams, but all up and down the valley, valley, you know, we do have several teams. Um, some teams outside of our area have developed their own radio protocols so they can operate independently. Um, and okay, here's, here's my real opinion. Um, my philosophy is different. We have a healthy, active ARIES program here. And I think that is gold. And in my opinion, we didn't need to reinvent the wheel. So to reduce the number of troublesome choices that you have to make on the fly in an emergency, we didn't want our people to have to think, okay, am I, am I responding as a CERT using this kind of radio at this channel, or am I responding as an ARIES member using this other kind of radio on this frequency? So, it, it's piggybacks on an existing my personal opinion. Uh, you know, also, ah, I like, I have some more opinion. So as a CERT team deploying by itself, your team being called out as a cohesive unit, that's probably the least likely scenario for deployment. We talk about it a lot, that's what the class all focuses on. But you're far more likely to be embedded individually in existing teams more trained responders. So that's why it's important to learn ICS. And that's how we need to know how to respond and integrate with those other agencies. Jeez. Hopefully, uh, with this background, you can now see how CERT training paired with radio skills can be a powerful combination. And if you're interested in taking CERT basic training classes, um, classes are opening up again, all up and down the valley. Uh, I've heard a lot of programs have been kind of in limbo over the COVID crisis. Um, you can fill out the form, or you can contact me directly, but you can fill out the form at, and here's a URL, uh, bit.ly slash cert-utahcounty. If you 
go to bit.ly, that's bit.ly slash cert-utahcounty. Uh, there's a Google form, enter your contact information, and judging from your town, we will forward your information to the closest active town, and then you can arrange for some training. Um, I'll hang around afterward to answer any questions. Uh, I might even go to Apollo for the first time, for the first post-meeting party. Um, so if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer. Do you want to take questions live here? A couple, a a couple just a couple. Okay, two questions. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did cert like 12 years ago. Uh, is there updated information or is there brush up courses or things beyond complete overhaul of certification available? It's a great question. He asked um, whether there's 12 years ago, um, just when he got involved, but you know, is there any uh, to put it, um, is there any way to just refresh kind of your skill set? And we get that question a lot. Okay, first off, though, once you are trained in CERT, um, you're considered trained. Uh, there's some programs across the country, very few, that are really strict about training and want people to keep updated. But um, once you're at CERT, you're a CERT. You're trained. Not, not a lot has changed in the curriculum since the time you took it. So for refresher courses, we talked about those online courses that take care of the boring lecture part. Anyone can take those. You don't have to be affiliated with any team. Um, there's also uh, the, uh, what's the uh, FEMA training, online training site? They have uh, some cert overview that you can take for free there. So online training, very easy. You can do it at your own pace, play it on the video, take it easy. If it wasn't for cert, I wouldn't be here now. Really? That's how it all started. Oh, yeah. So, Aries has introduced a lot of people to CERT. CERT, I hope, has introduced a lot of people to Aries. Uh, there was a hand back here, I think. No? Okay, how about here? Uh, a, will there be some more training at the Rock Canyon Fire Station? Um, it depends on what the emergency manager wants. I think um, he's using that training room quite a bit. But we will let you know when we have more training planned. We've been doing those monthly check-ins or monthly trainings uh, for the duration of the pandemic. The one where you had the generator guy. Yeah, good. the emergency power. Yeah. yeah, and he has another presentation that he wants to sh wants to do. So just keep tuned to the Facebook groups and uh, maybe to Telegram and see what you can keep track of when you, when some of these new activities come across. We don't have um, a ton that's really solid right now in Provo Forum, but keep in mind there's other teams that are, all, are very active also. Yeah, but, uh, that CPR when they do. Yeah, that high performance CPR was awesome. Okay, quickly. Um, is there a minimum age limit for these? Because I have a son who would love this, but he wants it too. It depends on what the program wants to allow. We've allowed anyone, uh, especially like scout age, uh, anyone to come if they have a parent or guardian with them. Um, it's just that with real young kids, who weren't taking the training, but babies were brought in hand. Wow, that was distracting for that couple. Uh, so we'd, we'd suggest you avoid that. But as far as being trained, yeah. If they're a teenager, I say they're a fair game, or 12. You know? He mentioned something that I, I gotta ask about. Um, when I took, when I took CERT, they steered us all the way around CPR. Mm, yeah. And, 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 and it was like the forbidden fruit. You know, yeah. you weren't allowed to do CPR. You weren't allowed to learn it, or they didn't teach it, or anything else at the time. And it was like uh, they kind of butted heads with, with you know, other other aspects of uh, saving somebody's life. And so, do they still teach it, or you talked about they teach CPR? Or what's that's the a, that's that's kind of extra community class. So we do training sometimes where the whole community is invited. In fact, that's where it's heading a lot more in Pro Warm is whole community involved classes because they get a lot more response and they can affect a lot more people. We were asking about CPR and why CERT doesn't teach CPR. Um, that has to do with, I mean, the CERT model, which I didn't tell you guys, I'm sorry, uh, do the greatest good with the greatest number. Right. And that makes means you make some hard decisions sometimes when you're responding. But one of those decisions involves how much time am I going to spend? So once you start CPR, you can't stop. Can't stop. You go, you keep going. And what if you're the only person there? So that takes away when, your attitude. When you could help other people. Yeah. If, if they flatlined, if they're dead, insert retrain, mark them dead and move on because you're not, 
most people are not capable of doing that all by themselves to resuscitate someone. So it's a matter of what if you help five people live, or you can help one person maybe have a with a percentage chance of CPR being successful. It's it's not stellar, but it's something. So it's one of those hard decisions you have to make. She's like, no, I'm good. So she starts walking off the trail. You know, 15 minutes later, her daughter came back and said, no way, can't do it. Said, okay, I'm on the radio, called dispatch. Dispatch said, SAR, that's kind of how, how that all operates. Uh, we have high camp team. So if you like to camp, there's a up at the, has anybody up at, uh, been at Emerald Lake up in the camp? Raise your hand. A little bit, a quarter mile below Emerald Lake, we have a camp. And we're there for the weekend, and uh, we hang out at Emerald Lake where the where the shack is, that shelter. Uh, we're on radio communication with the trailheads, with Stewart Falls. Everything's uh, coordinated. We actually call dispatch 911 from our radios on the mountain to check in. And when if 911 gets a call, 911 calls us because we're already there. And then we take care of the situation, assess it, let them know what's going on. That goes down to the sheriff's office, and then they, if we need to extract someone, then Life Flight, SAR team coming up, Force Posse, the, the sheriff's office decides with all the resources who's going to go. But we're the first ones there to kind of coordinate it, radio in, and assess the situation. Um, like I said, we're on two meter radio. We're also on 800 megahertz uh, public service radios. Um, and then, you know, we're involved with Life Flight. So we get trained with life flight. Uh, last year, I had two simultaneous life flights at, uh, at Emerald Lake, which is it's rare, but we do get life flight up there. I mean, every two times a season, uh, we got a situation where we just call them in. Say, hey, this is the situation. Boom, life flight's in ten minutes and get them off the mountain. Interested? There's a training in Aspen Grove um, this April 30th. Outdoor training, we handle radio, first aid, every training, no matter what, if you're radio or not, everybody gets trained in first aid, no matter what. Uh, you need some basic level. Even if, you know, we have EMTs on the team, and you're the radio guy, but sometimes, like in a situation, my first day, my very first day, um, I barely got my radio figured out how to even work. I'm up on the mountain, and uh, one, one of our guys, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, actually a UCARE guy, came walked down the mountain with his son, talked to us, chatted us up, left down the mountain. Half an hour later, he calls us on the radio and says, hey, I'm hurt, I need help. And so the team lead sends me and an EMT down to check it out. We go down there, and his ankle looks like that. So you're not going to walk off the mountain. So now I got an EMT, but he needs help. So even though I'm the radio guy, I got help. You know, get this tape out, get this, get that. I mean, you know, so everybody's involved in medical. There's radio specialty, which I'm assuming you, that's what you'd be interested in. But uh, anyway, that's that's a little bit about Timpano emergency, emergency team. How much time do we have? Here? Uh, Thirty seconds. A couple of questions. Anybody? Go ahead. I think I remember uh, seeing that there were certain requirements in order to become nurse. Um, they they'll train you on everything. But don't let that scare you. They like to have medical and, and radio, yeah. metal and or radio, um, and they'll train you on everything. Yeah. Do you have a website? Terp, T E R T dot org. There's information on signing up. You have to get vetted with the sheriff's office mm -hmm. and uh, sign up with Terp. Come to the training, and you're all squared away. Come see me after if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, let's
time for door prizes. Brent, are you ready? I am ready. All right, let's turn it over to you. All right. So just like last time, uh, Noji apparently lost the tickets. <laughs> so I'm going to be doing this from my phone again. It's on a it's on a a wheel. I just push the, push the spin button. Everybody is on here. Once you've been, if your name has been selected, your name will be removed from the wheel, and we will continue to go on. All right, we're going to be doing five prizes overall. We've got three, or yeah, here are our main prizes. We've got the AWRL membership. We have a a ginger beer. Oh, never mind then. You can pick one of these three antennas. I thought we had more than this. So that's, these are our two main prizes. Okay, so we're starting with these, and then for our two main prizes, we have radio and, of course, a pop first J-Pole. So, person number one. KJ7 SNE 6565. Sure. Gone. Wow. Don't just <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. Number two. Is not Trevor Holyoke, but is 0410 KI7 SIC. Did you leave? Okay, so we'll hide, hide him, we'll spin again. Zero three seven five KI seven HBP. Did he also leave? Zero three seven five. Oh man, he caught me. Seven nine six one KJ seven IKH. No, these weren't this this is this month. <laughs> there were people that were getting up and walking out and I'm wondering if some of these are just, so you just have to call all the people that <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, not, it's not me, I swear. Sure. One, two, three, four. Ron. Ron. The ginger beer or one of the antennas? Okay. Don't touch that. Don't touch that one? You can take it. I knew it was good for something. Oh, gosh. That, that brought back so many unpleasant memories as a kid. You know those wooden paddles? Oh. Okay, yes. That's the video. So the person who gets the ginger beer. Not alcoholic. Yeah, you may not it's want not to alcoholic. shake it either. It is not alcoholic. <laughs> 1087. N-J-E-K-F. Did he leave? <laughs> or N70KF, I'm sorry, did he leave? <laughs> 1976. Where is he? Oh! <laughs> This is 
is our main prize, and then we have the two, or this is our three, three prizes, and then we have the two main prizes. Okay. My apologies. Okay, so first up, for our main prizes, we have the radio and the Popper's J-Pole. And normally what I'll do is I'll spin for the first one, and then whoever, win whoever wins will come up and pick up one of these two prizes, and then the second one will take the remaining one. <laughs> zero, 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 Heath. I guess I know what numbers I'm picking next time. Uh, one, two, three, four, or zero, zero, zero. <laughs> Which one would you like? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so we have the radio or the pocket shape. All right. Well, get license, so All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and for the Pockers J poll. Oh yes. By the way, I forgot to tell you. Thank you so much, Nochi. This Pockers J poll comes with free labor from Noji. <laughs> So if you do not know how to put this up, or you're just too darn lazy, well, your problems are solved. That's a Tenoji. Six one seven one. K seven R C Z. That's me, but I already won something. So. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I must have forgotten to hide you. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> How many people have you here? Five, 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 five. Five, 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 five. That's you. But go ahead and donate. I've already got one. Let's do it again. Okay, let's do it again. Five, 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 five. Five, 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 five. Right there. I think I somehow might have accidentally intermixed the two wheels from last month. I'll delete both wheels. So I apologize about that. <laughs> and congratulations to all of our door prize winners. <laughs> if it's any credit to me, it's Noji's fault because he lost the tickets.